Um, Dr. Helen Mayburn, um, we're very glad to have this little interview with you. And first of all, I would like you to introduce yourself and say your credentials for the camera. My name is Dr. Helen Mayberg. I'm a neurologist and neuroscientist. I work at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia in the United States. Um, I would like to know um, right now um, in your career or in your practice or in science as a whole, what would be the hot spot in the thing that you are more interested or more for it? So I think we are at an interesting point in neuroscience and clinical neuroscience as it affects thinking about emotion and mood disorders and psychiatric disease. I think we know more about the brain than we've ever known, but I think we're also more frustrated than we've ever been because we know a lot, but we don't know enough. Right For me right now, the work over 30 years has been to try to understand brain circuits that are involved in depression, and I think we and the community have made a lot of progress. And the important things now, or the focus, is to see that if what we've learned can be applied in the clinic. So if we have patterns to distinguish people whose brain type will respond to drug versus their brain type will respond to therapy, we want to test if that's actually a useful test to do to see if we can get people reliably well. So a lot of my lab's work is very focused on testing those ideas. And I think that if we can identify some brain scan changes, then we can really work hard to figure out how to implement scanning in the clinic or find other ways to do it more easily and more broadly, because not everybody has a scanner. And what are the results that you have till now on this possibility of choice between what brain responds to like therapy, cognitive behavior therapy that I've heard that's the thing that you're working in the point of therapy and medication. So we looked and didn't take sides. We took people who were depressed. We did expert treatment with either therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy or a medication. And we looked to see if anything about their brains were different in the people who did really well on either one, or who did really terrible on either one. And after a lot of analysis, it turns out that there's an area of the brain, and it's an area of the brain that many people have studied, the insula, yes. and, but an area that analyzes and is your determinant of your internal state, your interoceptive awareness. And obviously, depression is about discomfort, pain, inability to move. Your stress system is high, and can you react to it or not? Can you modulate it? So the insula is an interesting area. And when it's high, you need medicine, which turns it down. If it's low, you're not processing your internal state, and it can be trained. And cognitive therapy trains the insula to respond appropriately to information from the outside world or your environment. So we're testing whether or not that really works if we do it in a prospective way instead of making an inference from a retrospective analysis. But this is not the only area we care about because some people don't get better on drug or therapy. And some people, over time, have repeated episodes of illness and stop responding to anything. So we're equally interested in how to get everybody, if you're ill, the best treatment for that person. If you need surgery, then you need surgery. If all you need is therapy, and therapy is not easy. Therapy is actually much harder to do, but you have to have a brain that can do the therapy, or even therapy is not effective. I'm interested and what is the mechanics? How does the brain adapt? How does it do its job? And when brain circuits go wrong, 
or they try to compensate in a bad way. How does that make someone worse? And we think a treatment should be effective and it's not. How do we understand that? And that way we can try to recalibrate the brain in a way, if you could. Uh, Ian, what was the thing that really um, you like or was surprised the most in your um, journey of this research, if there is some? I think what I've learned is that the brain doesn't know what normal is. The brain adapts. I always had the point of view that if you would just identify what was wrong, you would realign it. It would be straightforward that the problem was you just didn't know where to make the, the change. Now what I'm realizing is every time you make a change, the brain doesn't like it. It doesn't know it's good or bad. It just keeps trying to go back to whatever its comfortable position is. Whether it's your weight, whether it's your mood, whether it's your how you play tennis, bad habits are bad habits, and the brain has habits. And we're learning that it's much more complicated, it's not linear, that we have to be thinking about when we make a change, the brain fights us back. And we're much more fragile, as adaptive as our brain is, to change it when it's not working properly is not as easy as we might have thought. Um, What we know is that if you had a scan where you had a hyperactive insula and you were treated with a therapy, you didn't get better. You didn't get worse. It just wasn't effective. And when you were treated with the medication, some of the patients, not all of them, got better, but more got better than didn't. So I think that what we have to figure out is, does the wrong treatment kind of train the brain in the wrong direction? There's no net zero. There's always um, an attempt to compensate for anything new you introduce. And so I think we want to try to get people the right treatment, and then we deal with the secondary effects that we might produce by the process of getting them closer to their best. And in your um, idea or in your wish, uh, where do you think or where we are going to be 10 years from now in this specific area? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. No, uh, just uh, so, so or just, wish. Just, pre- just premising that. <laughs> yes. I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> I think that, you know, you look back 10 years, I couldn't have imagined these 10 years. On the other hand, I think that when the field feels unstable, feels unstable right now, people are frustrated, drugs aren't right, we don't, we're changing the definition of things, that usually is an indicator that something exciting is going to happen. Mm-hmm. The, the status quo is not right, and that I think with all the new tools, there will be a new window in terms of how we think about all of these psychiatric problems. I think for depression, we are going to come to grips with, it isn't that there are different classes and that to need medicine makes you a sicker patient than to need Mm -hmm. therapy, that our treatment stigma, not just the public stigma, but the way we interact as caregivers has got to change because there's equivalency. You know, and I think we're going to watch the fields evolve to where psychiatry, not to take away the individuality of a patient any more than we do that in medicine, but that we will have, if not precision, we will have a different biological appreciation of what learning and training is in therapy, what medications do, what surgery does, and I think we're going to have different names for our respective roles. I think that the device field, we're already seeing that people over were over-enthusiastic, and we're going through a period of disappointment because the initial results were very encouraging, And we're not as smart as we thought we were, but we're not wrong. We're going to develop 
things we can't even imagine, and that will be engineering. Companies will do that because the neuroscience says do that. We need it. We have to give them the reasons, not them to make devices, and then we, we make do. We need to help them to know what we need. And I see that as being the big change over the next 10 years. Uh, one last question that occurred to me. Why did you choose cognitive behavioral therapy um, as a therapy so, for the patients? So when, when I was doing the experiments on effects of medication to understand the circuit, we did an experiment with placebo drug. And we got the same pattern of change with placebo as we did with active drug. And what I realized is even when the paper was being reviewed, the criticism was, well, it's a form of psychotherapy to have placebo because they're in the hospital, they have the milieu of the hospital setting. And I said, well, we need to prove that all treatments work along a final common pathway. So my hypothesis back in 2000 was all treatments, all roads, if they were effective, would downregulate Area 25. That was my okay. simple-minded view. So I moved from Texas to Toronto, and Zindel Siegel, a I very well-known mm -hmm. cognitive behavioral therapist, writing not just about mindfulness, but really starting to study the biology of CBT, was in my institution. Lucky so, you, lucky. So lucky, <laughs> lucky break in the same way when for me, I was very interested in how does therapy change your brain, but I needed to proceduralize it because I knew the criticism for my studies of imaging how to control in a small sample. So here I have an expert in CBT. CBT offers a manual-based approach. You can control the experiment, which is the treatment, and basically engage um, Dr. Siegel to work with us. I think we could have done a study on interpersonal psychotherapy because also can be proceduralized. Mm -hmm. I think that those were the evidence-based psychotherapies. If you say, and the data says that this is an effective treatment, let's see how it affects the brain. And that's so my work is about trying to understand the circuits of emotion. So this entire story has just been step by step to find the patterns and to use the treatments in a way to see if the brain areas we care about are, are the right ones or not. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for all these wonderful things that you are by chance <laughs> doing. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to tell you about it. It's been a wonderful <laughs> meeting.